Schools and School Districts, which is in Nassau County. Scott. Awesome. Uh, You're my kind of people. I love New York. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I'm, I'm Scott, Scott Bedley. I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you the question I start interviews with when I interview the candidates for positions. Now, Scott, what's your deal? My deal, oh my gosh, where where do I start? That's that's a big question. Uh, no, I, I teach uh, fifth grade right now out in uh, Southern California in a city called Irvine, and I've taught uh, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and high school in my 20-year career. So I'm going to be starting my 21st year, and uh, just really passionate about education and and asking the why questions, like why are we doing this, and uh, and then trying to come up with solutions, not just questioning or. Uh, bucking the system, but asking like, really, is this really what's best for kids? So that's kind of my deal is what's best for kids. And uh, I'm not afraid to um, go against the norm to to get to that. Great. Well, my favorite question to ask. Yeah. Every decision we make, we have to run it through that filter. Absolutely. Yeah. Scott, your, both your blog posts and a couple of tweets got my attention. Um, and uh, so you, you spoke about making homework optional. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, my it's kind of started back in 2007 when we did an action research study at my grade level. And, and to give you a better idea, I, I teach at currently as a departmentalized fifth grade. So I teach uh, certain subjects. My teaching partner teaches others. And we our kids rotate between them. And, and we wanted to look at, like, the effectiveness of, of homework. Uh, it had never really been questioned or... I, I didn't know any questions about it. So um, we started by asking the question, like, is it really effective? And so how do we study that? So we didn't eliminate homework. Or we're, we're not definitely not against homework or I'm not against homework or anything like that. We just wanted to question its, its real effectiveness. So we took a, a math unit. We did a pre-assessment on students. We also did a pre-observation in a normal classroom setting of engagement as well as participation. Um, and we had two outside teachers outside of our district actually doing that and watching the kids and keeping track of, you know, co uh, contributions, how much interactions they had with each other, time on task, uh, uh, several different areas. And um, from that study, we found that uh, the group of students or the class that got the least amount of homework, which was less than our normal homework, so we had one group that got less, one group that got our normal amount, and one actually group that got more. We wanted to see, you know, if giving more homework was better. Um, the, the group that had the least amount of homework not only showed uh, like statistically the highest increase from pre to post test, but also the highest level of engagement in class, as well as um, like class participation, just their approach to the subject matter of math in that case just changed their attitude. Uh, we also saw side effects of because we also um, surveyed parents before and after, you know, how are their relationships with their kids and those seem to shift to be become more positive because there's less battles over homework happening at home from the information we got back from those surveys. So it was an interesting study and that was 2007. Go ahead. Kathleen, did you have a question? I Just one question about, yeah. Um, what do you classify as homework? Because for some people, homework is just paper, and for me, it's not. I mean, there's a lot of different things that I do um, in my class for with my kids for homework. But I just wanted to know what what you used as a model for homework in that situation. Uh, everything done at home considered homework. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. I had that question too. Right, right. So in that study, and then we can get into kind of what what homework is and how we wanted to find it. But in that study, it was based on what would be like a typical teacher, I would say a typical teacher's math homework. It was a number of practice assignments and problems. And um, the, the numbers would vary depending on the subject matter and that instruction that day. So uh, let's, let's say typically, you know, you have 25 or so problems that the kids might have to practice. And so one group got more than that, one group got less than that. So it was based on number of problems in this case. We didn't vary the type of homework. We wanted just some baseline information that was what we saw would be normally assigned homework in math. So practices, practice problems. Okay, so then I have another question. Sure. Um, what about what you did with the kids during class time? How did that change? Because was it exactly the same activity during class with each group? Or did you change? Did you vary 
what you did with the kids based on the fact that they had this homework or that homework or no homework. Well, the lessons were generally the same. I, I can't say they were I, identical. It's like we didn't read yeah. off the script or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the lessons were, were generally the same. Um, so we tried to eliminate as many variables, but the reality is, you know, in that kind of setting, we have variables. And even in my blog post, I say, you know, I don't equate all the solutions to this optional homework policy. It's just I want people to get up on the fence and look at things differently rather yeah. than being on one side or the other. Because oftentimes I see in the debate on homework, it's either let's eliminate homework, get rid of it, it's bad for families, or let's, you know, require it. Let's So there wasn't a middle ground. So I, that's when I started thinking in this past year, and actually a little bit before this past year, uh, how do I get to a middle ground where um, this pillar, this kind of, uh, in this homework that's almost like a part of the DNA of education now. Uh, how do yeah, I do. how do I pull that out and and make it so that it's palatable and I can actually do this? And and so um, I, that's when I just said I'm going to go for this. I'm going to go for optional and see what happens. Uh, and it was all based on that research. It was based on like continuing to look at different current research. Uh, trying to find anything that really supported homework. And again, I, I, I go back to if somebody presented information to me that said homework is extremely valuable for kids and, uh, and it was really statistically sound and gave me the evidence, then I would be all for homework. But I, can't, I couldn't find anything when we were doing our study. I still can't find any studies that really would support that. The closest thing I could say maybe to that is time on task. I know there's statistics and information about there on time on task, but I also was, in, you know, really interested in engagement for my kids. And so if I burn them out at home and they come into class and they miss the instruction in class, has, has that homework really served its purpose in any way? It's actually, no, it's, it's been a detriment. Or they go home and practice wrong. That's another thing. They'd go home and mm -hmm. practice wrong. Or um, a lot of people will say, I want it to be for responsibility. Well, we saw, yeah, for the kids, for some kids that may have uh, encouraged or continued their level of responsibility. Other kids, it actually was a negative because it gave them more opportunities to fall short and be irresponsible. So um, there, there wasn't like a clear cut line to say, hey, homework's, homework's great and it's so effective and I need to use this as a strategy to help kids learn better. Uh, and so this last year, I came at it from approach, and I and I stole this from Sir Ken Robinson, and I'm sure a lot of people heard this. It's like, I don't want just kids to be able to do the work. I want them to be better learners, so that when they're with me or not with me, they can learn better. And I I, I know it's not necessarily the correct way of he said it. He's so eloquent, but you know that's you know his, his analogy that I've heard him use um, was you know we don't take people to the hospital to keep them sick as they are and just maintain that level of sickness, we want them to get better. And so that's the same thing as, as I approached it for. So I don't know where you want me to go from there, Don. <laughs> so we have nice to um, I actually have this as the ASCD book. Uh, that oh. You referenced the, um, the, the link that Scott uses on his blog post is a really terrific primer, I think, if you wanted to you know, some people will, well, I want to see some of the research Scott's talking about. Uh, Scott links to an article that was in AICD a couple of years back, and I think it's from this book, which I actually found on my shelf because it was one of those ASCD membership books. So I suspect that most of us have that sitting behind us on our mm -hmm. shelf. Okay, so if you were, you, if you want the body of research behind some of what Scott's talking about, Scott gives it to you in the blog, you know. Uh, I, I want to welcome Dan McCabe. Dan's one of our other uh, Long Island uh, um, Hey, guys. Out of East Knox Park, Dennis is also. We had, a, we had a meeting last week, uh, Scott, for Ed Camp Long Island, which is coming up September 13th. Awesome. We had a great planning meeting, and all these folks are on the planning committee for that. We got excited also talking about this uh, Google Hangout learning from you. So that's why there's a bit of word of mouth here, too. Very cool. Hey, that's, that's the best way. And you know what? That's the book our, our district went through when we were examined. And at the very beginning of the post, I just kind of referenced that. And um, our book, our district started looking at homework. Um, and I think that was admirable because they started doing that a few years ago. And they were, to me, they were ahead of where, you know, a lot of people were at. And so um, 
definitely not to knock them, but it, it's hard to change something that's so institutionalized like homework. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I don't think you can go from like, you know, required homework to eliminating, at least not in, you know, our community. It's just, it's just not possible. And again, I'm not advocating for eliminating homework. I think effective, uh, self-guided, uh, self-motivated homework is a great thing. We all want to learn more. That's why we're talking right now is we're learning more about something. That's why we go to ed camps, right? So mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a passion for it. So how do I, as a teacher, build in a passion so that my kids want to go home and learn more about a subject matter rather than because I, I require it? Talk about parents. How did the parents take to this idea? Well, the, 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 the conversation was not wrapped around homework because I felt that that's, that's a line that's going to be drawn in the sand. It's going to be a battle then, right? So the conversations are framed for me around learning and around what's best for their child's learning and what, what statistics and what data and what information's out there so that I can be the best possible teacher. Um, that I can and that they can be the best possible learners they can. So I don't, I've, I've never framed the conversation with parents around homework directly. It's always been around the learning and what the learning process is and how kids learn and how they learned. And I, a lot of times when I were talking to parents about it, I tie it back to the, to their experience with homework. Uh, mm. and, and, you know, I, again, I can't say I had a hundred percent buy-in, uh, but I had a lot of parents actually thanking me and saying, thank you for doing this. Um, and I, I even had a former parent uh, post a comment on the blog saying, I wish you would have done this a few years ago. And um, <laughs> and uh, so uh, I wish I would have too. I wish I would have had a little bit uh, more um, foresight to do it sooner than I did. Uh, so... Yeah, I, I think it's a, a, a focus of how do you build a relationship first of trust with parents. And then, have any pushback from parents? I, I got a little bit of questions, but but the thing is when it's optional, it's it's not that I'm saying that their child doesn't need to do homework. I'm giving right. that power to the parents. So, um, you know, it's perfectly okay with me if a parent decides that they want their child to spend more time studying. I think that's a decision pe parents are going to make. They're going to put them, put their child in tutoring. They're going to put them in extra after school classes. They're going to do extracurricular activities, whatever. That's their parent choice. I just didn't want to make that choice right. for them as a school anymore. I wanted to say, hey, if you want to extend your learning opportunities, if you want to extend your knowledge in this area, here's a great place to go with a homework assignment or something that you could work on at home that would extend your understanding of this topic. But, uh, you know, it's optional. Great, Scott. So that's the question now that occurs to me. Let's talk about practicality. What does it look like? Uh, Scott's teaching, is it something that you prep a lot, but this is what's available because you know that it's optional and X number of kids will do it. How much attention are you giving tonight's homework in that class that day? Well, I, okay, so I think there's Stop two parts. Posting website or something? Where is it? We do have homework on website, but there's um, there's two parts to that question. So for me, one of the parts is that making homework optional gave me more time in class. So um, I because oh, you didn't have to because you didn't have to discuss the homework. Didn't have to discuss the homework. Didn't have to explain this. Didn't have to go over it. A lot of times it was more informal. Sometimes it was formal and planned out. So sometimes it'd be like, hey, if you want to take this extend this activity that we started in class focused on cells and continue your research on home. Here's a couple of places that you can look. Uh, or, you know, this, this project is due two days out. Uh, the time you're going to have in class would probably get you to be able to complete the project, but is it going to get you to where you want to be successful as a student, the knowledge that you need to know, and here's what you need to know. And so defining that for the kids helped them to kind of look at not kind of, it helped them to examine, you know, how do I prioritize and set aside my time. I recently read um, uh, another study on structured versus unstructured time for students and how unstructured um, actually leads to higher levels of, of organization, <laughs> which sounded interesting to me, but, they, but the, because they're making the choices. And so they have to decide that. Now, not every student uh, initially got the hang of the optional homework. And so they said, oh, optional homework, you know, yay, no homework that means, right? Right. Okay. So of course you're going to get that initial response, 
But then what that all that did for me as a teacher was to motivate me to make the learning that much more engaging in class so that they're going to want to go home and learn about it. And so that's that was one of the side effects for me personally that I didn't anticipate in the whole process because, you know, I thought I was doing a, a great job always being engaging, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, and that's something I, I, I do each year. I try to examine how much I'm talking in class. I actually do word count where I type out everything I say the entire day to see how many words I'm using and then try to cut down on that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think it's just a matter of, you know, trying to put the kids in control and, and empower them in things that they can be, they can do, and they can do that. So, so Scott, you, it sounds like you're talking about it happens sort of organically. You don't, like, okay, you don't say, okay, it's Tuesday, this is what I'm doing in class, and have you dropped that whole model of here's, the, and this is the assignment I'll be giving that night? Allow it to happen more organically, or do you find you have a searching mind, you're looking for enrichment? I, I, I don't I hate I don't need to be annoying with all these questions. No, no, no. I, I did. So a lot a lot of times it was intentional because um, when I'm when I'm planning out the lessons, I'm looking at okay, what would be something that I could offer the students that would be optional and engaging for them to do at home if they if they chose to or their parents chose to have them extend that learning experience in class. And so those options and those um, things were intentional a lot of times. Uh, not every time though. Sometimes it was, you know, I wanted to get to the point, like my goal, I guess, ultimately, and, and this is still in the reflection process for me, was to get to the point where I, I had the students so excited about a topic that they wanted to go home and study on it, you know, or they wanted to go home and continue that blog post, or they wanted to go home and you know, learn more about that science topic like organ systems or whatever it might be. Now, where does uh, homework fit in? Like some people, we give homework for kids to, as formative assessment, okay? You, I want to see where, the, where the, the kids in my class are with what I just taught. Um, are you ever using homework in, in, that, in that way? No. Okay. So uh, I just but, don't, I don't trust... Um, the accuracy of that information. That's it did at all. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So that's great. That's, that's copy. It's so it, it could be copied. Then, it, it could be overhelped. It could be underhelped. I mean, it could be. You know, there was so many variables right. on on that information. I just didn't trust its accuracy. And so, if I didn't trust its accuracy to to help guide my instructions, why would I trust its accuracy in helping a student learn? You know. <laughs> That's so obvious. Um, do you, uh, do, is it blanket? You know, do you ever have the kids, okay, guys, tonight I need you to go home and do this because I need you to come in and hit the ground running with this test? Um, I, 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 right. I mean, in a, in a sense, yes, but I, I was more of, became more of a salesperson. So, uh, because I wanted to hold myself to the option, I had to really sell it if I want, if I felt like it was meaningful, I had to really sell to them, like, here's why this is meaningful, and here's why this is going to benefit you. And so, uh, you're all in. You're yeah. All in. Yeah. And that's, so, I think that's probably a lot more powerful than people realize. I think, yeah, you have to be all in. And you can guys I, know. Can I jump in here with a question? Yeah, go for it. I just, just out of curiosity, this is reminding me of I guess, what is your yeah. students a chance to, hey, go, go explore what, you know, your, your passion, essentially. The, my question, I guess, is this. Um, when you initially launched this idea, um, was there, a, did, you, did you have some scaffolding going on as far as here's a menu of options, things you can do since you don't have homework, or was it sort of like, you don't have homework, see you tomorrow? No, yeah, it wasn't It wasn't just like you don't have homework, because that's eliminating it, right? So the whole point of it was to make it just optional. So there's always things that they had the option of going home and doing, and there's honestly, there's kids that like homework. So I didn't want to take that away from them either. I mean, there's parents too in a strange world, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, I did build in options for for them as as we went went along, and I and I went and I I went slow to go fast. So it wasn't like 
day one, I'm like, hey, everybody, optional homework this year. Yay. There's like a huge party breaks out, right? <laughs> Woo! Like, but wouldn't kids react that way, right? They would be so stoked. Like, optional homework, my gosh. Um, and, and again, initially, when I said this homework assignment is optional, I started phasing it in in subject matters. Um, the kids were like, well, what do you mean optional? And, and I was like, well, you could do it or not do it. And they're like, are you serious? They're like, <laughs> they didn't believe me at first, right? They're like, oh my gosh, it's it's optional? And so at first they were like, everybody would still try to bring in their homework because they were worried, like, if I don't do it, I, I don't really believe him. He's going to like nail me tomorrow and I'm going to have to be doing homework some other time or something like that. So, um, uh, and then there became this little bit of atmosphere of peer pressure of like trying to get their homework in and uh, you know, you can really use praise in that way. So as well as like, wow, you really learned some more. Do you want to share it with the class with some things, extra things you learned? And what I found is that in some subject matters that I might assign certain things for homework, the kids went further than I would have ever assigned them. And so sometimes when I, I limit, like homework can be limiting as well. Like if I only assign them this, right. what if they had gone beyond what I ever expected of them? And so. Right, because they didn't have so much time for it. Right, right. Right. And, and it, you know, it, it, for me, it also gave kids the freedom to, to be able to do their, you know, follow their passions or interests or just spend time with their family and hang out with their brothers or sisters or, you know, have a little bit of balance like all of us really, uh, you know, like in life and know that keeps us healthy and, and uh, excited about what we're doing. So. Did you find that kids were reading more, you know, for personal enjoyment, the fact that they didn't have so much homework to do? You know, I don't, I don't think I have enough information to answer that question accurately. So I'm not, I'll say I'm not sure on that one. I, I know um, the engagement in class was far greater. And I know um, the depth of the, the subject areas. I can make an assumption on that, Danielle, but I'm, I don't have like concrete evidence to say, yeah, for sure that they were reading more because of this. But I, I suspect that based on um, uh, on the amount of information that the kids came in knowing about subjects that, I, I mean, we're supposed to teach, you know, I think five different human organ systems. And that's that's what we're, our, our pacing guides are for, and that's what we're told, five, five organ systems. And that's what our textbook does and all this kind of stuff. Well, when I did an assigned homework, the kids went home and they started learning about so much more uh, and in-depth information about almost all the organ systems, uh, that's when I knew, like, yeah, that's how I can say I, I can kind of make the assumption that they were reading more. Um, but if you're talking just, like, fictional reading, I don't necessarily have, like, a one-to-one -one equation to know whether or not that, that that's true. Responsibility-wise increased dramatically. Like, uh, the amount of assignments that were coming in, the preparation that the kids had for class, just, just by bringing their subject materials and things like that, it, it just seemed like that they were coming more prepared. I I speeded up my pace a little bit. Pacing is always a tough thing in teaching, right? So um, I was able to accelerate my pacing and, and boil things down to being more about what was needed to focus on than, you know. So there, there was just a lot of little side benefits, I guess, as I'm, I continue to reflect on it. Scott, was this in your fifth grade class you did this? This is fifth grade, yeah. Now, just out of curiosity, just to frame it out for us, was that is that an elementary model? Is it a middle school model? I'm actually at a K-8 here. Okay, so my next question is, what happened in sixth grade? Well, we'll find out. <laughs> we start <laughs> back. We start back in a week and a half. Um, oh, okay. I, I anticipate it not impacting them. It's, it's well, hey, the lights went out on me. Hang on really fast. Sorry about that. I'm not. I'm not moving enough. Scott's gonna get an earthquake. Hopefully not. Uh, I'm not that far from Scott right now. <laughs> I'm in San Clemente. Oh, nice. Um, I I think yeah. as far as like what'll go on, I I I don't know. We'll find out. But part of me anticipates that. I, and I've, I've, when talking to other people about this, I, I said, I, I talked to a school up in Northern California yesterday and the principal there, a uh, great principal, 
asked me, you know, she's like, well, what do you, what happens when they get a bunch of homework the following year or something like that? And I said, well, you know, and definitely not, not to knock like, uh, any professions or anything like that. But if you're going into a profession that might seem a little more boring, like accounting or something like that, uh, and not to knock accountants, we love accounts are important jobs. But you know, does that mean that I should have my classroom really boring to prepare kids for that? Uh, that potential profession? No, I don't think so. So um, uh, and I and I was still seeing responsibility and them completing tasks on time. I still had deadlines for projects within class. I still had you know, all those things that would could still build responsibility within the classroom structure. And so it wasn't like I said, oh, this is, it, it wasn't like this free for all, like, hey, everybody, just whatever you want to do, just go for it. Um, there's still all those structures built. They're just built in the class time, the time that I'm given with those kids. Let's play a little devil's advocate, with Scott. I'm sure you don't mind. But, um, it's not, like, I, I've only got, I'm a, I'm a middle school um, English teacher. I see the kids 40 minutes a day. I've only got X amount of time. I, I've got to assign them tasks to do at home as well. To get through the curriculum, right? I didn't even say that. But <laughs> even, let's say, how about even I, I come from a place of real integrity? I'm just saying just the things we need kids to learn and, and develop. To, as you said at the beginning, you know, help me with that. What do you think, what do you think I would tell parents? You know? I, th I think that's – that. It's like you said, no. I'm not eliminating homework. It's I'm just saying it's optional. I've got kids in here that you probably you likely have kids who who don't need to do it for homework. You're, again, I love the way you said it. It's like the three bears approach, right? Some homework is too little, some homework is too much, and the kid kind of gets to gets to make those decisions. And the parent and you, you you as the teacher, right? Yeah, and then I I also think uh, you know that w when homework is optional, there becomes a different approach to it. You know, uh, when jobs at home are required, it becomes like a pain. Like, uh, so I think just the the approach to to working at home or learning more at home, and and I think the the answer, Donald, back to what you were given that scenario is, is what is the what is the kind of framework of um, this whole yeah. this whole philosophy about it's about learning, and so. Yeah. Tying it back to what we want, do we want kids to get through curriculum or do we want them to be better learners? And how much curriculum equals better learners? I don't, you know, that's kind of where I'm coming from is I, I want my students to leave being able to learn regardless. And I say this to my kids almost like weekly, like you don't have to wait to come back to class to learn. You can keep learning. Now you live in, a, in an amazing time where you can keep learning no matter where you're at, which is awesome. It's it's an incredible thing. So when it, the focus really goes to learning, I think uh, that's when you can kind of let some things go and not be so afraid because it's not about getting through this amount of curriculum. And I know I'll probably get crushed by people that are like, you got to get through the standards, otherwise they're not prepared for the next grade level. Well, what are the, you know, no, if they can. Yeah, that's always going to be an issue. Right, if they can, yeah, are you ever going to get through all the standards? But. Uh, if you I can homework help that, you know. Right, exactly. Uh, and so, it, it, and it can be a detriment, I think. I can make that argument as well. But, like, you know, it's it's just a matter of, like, what is it that if I might, they leave my class being able to learn more quickly, be able to access information, be able to know what's more accurate, be able to analyze things, be able to be critical thinkers about things, then whatever they get to the next level, it's going to be a better learning experience for them, and they'll, they'll keep that passion for learning. Sure. A lot of great one, of, one of the things that keeps coming across, Scott, is that you're teaching at, at, a, at a really um, a deeper, uh, analytic, uh, you know, so Scott, do you, you're teaching at that level. That's I, what you value in your class. It's great. That, that's what it is. Uh, yeah, I think that's, you know, I think the, the further I've got into teaching, the further away you can get and really start to analyze why you're doing this job. I mean, the first few years, you're just kind of, trying to get through because it's such a, a hard job to do and I have so much respect for the profession of teaching and, and administration and education and, and what we're trying to do. It's just a, it's a matter of like being able to say like really go back to that question of why are we doing this and is this best for our students and if, if I can answer that I feel like I can go forward with whatever I'm going to try to do if I can really uh, answer that. Um, 
in depth and and, uh, and justify why I'm making the choices I'm making. So, and again, I'm not trying to say homework's a bad thing. I'm just saying that there's no real evidence that it's a good thing. And so, why do I continue a practice when there's no evidence that it works? You know. Um, is there you give homework where the you need to give the kids feedback on, it, or there is an answer key, or yeah, that kind of thing. I just think feedback's how we learn. I I'm stealing stealing that phrase from one of my favorite podcasts. I don't know if you've ever listened to Freakonomics podcast, but yeah. uh, I love getting differing viewpoints, uh, and and I think it's it's really valuable to get outside of education viewpoints on things, and then how do I tie it into education? Uh, and I think that keeps me looking at things freshly, in a fresh way. So. Um, yeah, I, we have a couple of kids at home, and you know we can look through from a parent's eyes. You know, it's hard to take off your educator hat, but when we watch our kids doing homework, and excuse me, but some of the junk that they bring home to do, you know, as a parent, you're like ripping your hair out because a is this really necessary? B, what else could they be doing? Like you said, that's a more valuable use of their time. You know, pick up a book. You're going to learn more than you are, you know, by doing some of this junk. And any of the projects that come home, you know, is a hundred dollar trip to Michael's and half of my Saturday. So, you know, what are they learning from any of that? Right. You make good volcanoes, though, Danielle. You do. We've <laughs> <laughs> made some really great projects. You know, Don and I have definitely gotten through elementary school again. But you know, we don't need to do that. <laughs> That's what I always tell. I I think this is a common saying, but I always tell my my parents, "You've already done fifth grade, so please don't do it again. Let your kids." Uh, All right. You know, right. th that's how they're going to build responsibility. Yeah, I mean, can, I make a confession? can I make a confession between all of us and the entire internet? Yeah. Sure. Um, we've actually recently, or I should say someone in my neighborhood recently that I know very well, um, recycled the project that their older <laughs> daughter did to their younger son. That's great. And then changed the name. It was just one of those, one of those things. That's great. And they each did very well on it. <laughs> Four years apart. Well, thank God the rubric didn't change. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, I feel so much better that I got that out between all of us. Okay. You win yeah. the internet today, too. Yeah. Hey, God, did you try the room across the hall from you? Is homework in their room optional, too? And how's that play out? You know, other teachers in your school. No, it's not optional. Uh, they and and I'm a, they're okay with me doing things. I'm very lucky. I have awesome teaching partners and the people I teach with here have been really forgiving of my craziness and my uh, experimentation. I just feel like, you know, with the shift to Common Core and you guys are, are ahead of the game out there and everyone's using like uh, New York things, especially in California, we're looking a lot to you guys. But um, yeah, I, I think they, they've been very forgiving yeah. of me trying these things. And, and with this shift, it gives us, no one's experts anymore. So as far as curriculums be, means, and standards. So let's that opened up the world for me to say, okay, cool. I can finally try some different things now. I'm not experiment I'm, a little bit. Right. It's one of the things I really liked about Common Core and the NGSS because we have we have a, a little bit more flexibility, at least right now. You know, some of the great time to take risks. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Before it becomes some kind of accountability tool for for us instead right. of instead right. of uh, something to help learning so Scott I have a question um, do you do a lot of project-based learning I do so do you uh, do a lot of projects in your class I do uh, okay so did the quality of projects improve? yeah the quality of projects was was awesome um, right. But, the, but the, you know what? And the, and the 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 final product is imp, is important. But to me, the learning the process. The process. And the so process. Um, I could have read through the science textbook and followed the pacing guide. But rather than that, mm -hmm. we took the concepts and we went through the inquiry process with the mm -hmm. kids while we were learning about those subject matters, rather than just reading and learning and studying and testing and reading and learning and studying test and reassessing and all, all those things. We, we went through the entire inquiry process of what science is while learning about the project. So, or while learning about the content. So the right. kids were learning the process 
of how to learn and be so they can be better at learning than rather than just gathering information. So yeah. yeah. Are you doing your projects in school and not sending them home? Yes. Yeah, that's and, key. I did that when I was a teacher. And I, I, any kind of writing I did, anything that was extensive that required a process, we did it at home. Yeah, everything is is I give the kids enough time in school to complete projects. Now, if they want to, again, this goes to the optional part. If they want to continue working on at home, that's optional. That's up to them, and and you know they can choose to continue to do that, and a lot do. Right, Scott. At this point, do you have um, after having done this now? Do you have kind of a metrics to kind of show the effectiveness of, of that decision to make it to make homework optional? It's. Um, it's hard. No, I don't have anything like really incredibly concrete yet. I'm trying to figure out, and maybe you guys can help me, but I'm trying to figure out how do I measure something with a different group of students who are all individuals who um, I can use standard. It's hard to use standardized kind of assessments to mm -hmm. assess individuality. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it's kind of what I'm going through right now is trying to figure out how do I, I measure this and make it so that I can take it to the next level of being legit, more legitimate, I guess, than just some crazy idea that this crazy teacher in California tried. Just a thought, um, and I'm just I'm, I'm thinking this through because I, I mean I love the concept, but I, what if you looked at obviously there's you know some portfolio assessment involved that's um, you know along those lines as, as opposed to you know a, a number as a result, but what if you took your you know, your times and you said, okay, the, this group of students, you know, your three groups that you mentioned in the beginning, give them the same assignment and then see what kind of comes back. You know, this is the kid that did it, that chose to do it. This is the kid that had uh, three hours, a three hour assignment of doing it. And this is the kid that had, uh, you know, 30 minutes or something like that, or 50 minutes, if it's fifth grade, let's say. I mean, that's, and, I, I think and that's. And then have a rubric to go with, the, you know, to, to evaluate it. I think that'd be one way to definitely look at it for sure. I had a teacher in my old school that I used to work with who had a similar feeling about homework while she was also struggling with kids' lack of knowledge about current events. So she kind of melded those two, and for an entire year, she didn't give any homework related to the curriculum. You know, it was just, she was a social studies teacher, so there was nothing American history, no textbook questions, you know, none of the typical social studies homework. But what she did do is she asked kids to do current events articles with um, a specific kind of feedback format that she had developed with the kids on these articles. Um, and I think they had to do that two or three times a week, but no homework related to the curriculum. And you know, just in her assessment of this whole um, practice, she really found that the kids did no worse you know, yeah. on any of the, uh, you know, the tests or the any, anything going on in class. But what they did gain was an incredible sense of current events. So she was able to do more connections in class with things that were going on because they knew a lot about recent things. You know, and she tried to focus on themes in current events that she knew the kids would be able to pick up. So that was, you know, it was another interesting take on how homework can impact what the kids are doing in class. You know, because this had nothing to do with, you know, the Civil War. You know, it was just very current. I, yeah, and, and then Dennis, I can also tell you that you know, making homework optional didn't impact my students' scores on assessments. Didn't and in any negative way. In fact, you know, I saw um, better kinds of information coming from students, better quality work, better. You know, so in, in and again, I, I think I put that in the blog post. I can't tie it one to one to the to the optional homework, but I can say, and because it's only been one year now, if I see that same results next year, I can try to you know, make a little bit stronger of a case for it. But I can definitely say that, you know, the kids, it did it. There was no, uh, none of the fears that I had. And I think that a lot of people have, if I, if I eliminate homework, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? None of those fears came to um, fruition at all. I mean, they were, yeah, I was like, oh, whew, I don't have to be afraid of that anymore. I don't have to fear this. I, and and that's kind of why what I think drives a lot of people's homework policy is is, is fear, fear of their you know and they, and they because they have a passion for kids and they don't want to let their kids down and they don't want them to not learn, and I get that fear and I, I felt that same fear, as well. I just couldn't find data and information, and I think that's I've listened to too many Freakonomics podcasts is like. <laughs> 
I couldn't find data and information to really prove to me that this was a worthwhile practice, and so I had to change it. I couldn't just keep doing it. That's it's amazing to me. It's really you, you've really kind of broken the mold on you know it's the way we've always done it type of thinking. And when you really think about it, how big is what you did? You just it's it's a very small, very big decision that you made to do this. Yeah, it's ironic a little bit. Yeah, yeah that's what I love about it. You know, yeah, if I have the parents, I put my kid. He needs to do a lot of do homework. Okay, but but you know, it takes away from baseball. Don't do homework. You know, okay. It's, so elegant in its simplicity that yeah, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm here to support you as a family. I'm here to support you, your child as a learner. And the evidence doesn't show me that homework does it, but if you feel it does, hey, here's some great things that I think uh, are are good for kids and for people for learning. But if not, you know, there's no evidence that shows it helps, so it's not hurting me and my my student as as a learner either. So uh, something else I'm thinking has me thinking is um just to develop a, a bank of you know qualitative experiences that are, you know, really healthy alternatives to homework. You know, something like I'm thinking about my own kids. I have my wife and I have three kids at home, library programs. People climb over each other, fight with each other to participate in these library programs, and they're great. You know, my kids were at the library for an hour and a half last night making crepes. You know, they had a, they, they went to France. The library down the street from my house, we can walk there. And that was what they did this summer instead of homework. And obviously, they don't right. have homework in the summertime, but it's these are things that are going on all the time. That you know, I think when when you all of us parents as well, you're stuck in that. Oh, we have how much homework? It's ridiculous. Yep. If you're freed up of that, you basically put it on a family to say, look, there are some wonderful things you could be doing instead of homework. And it doesn't involve video games or SpongeBob or you know, riding your bike, going to the beach, going to the playground, going to the public library, you know, participating in programs. Um, just, I mean, that's just a. No, that's. I mean, that's awesome. Can you jump in for a minute too? Yeah, Dan, for sure. Hey guys, um, I'm fascinated listening to everything that Scott is saying because I'm still on board with, with all of it. But uh, I missed the, the first couple of minutes. I'm just really curious, and I'm intrigued by your interest in Freakonomics. I'm a big fan myself. But where did the the, the simple yet Knowing coming up with the concept of optional, how did that how did that come to you? Because it was always like a, a, a dichotomy of either all or nothing. Right, right. Yeah, you either do it or you don't. Right. And and you know, that's what many of us are up against. And those of us that are familiar with the research um, are constantly trying to evangelize not giving homework because there's no academic achievement to it. Yeah. And there's the status quo that we're all fighting against in the conventional wisdom. But what a way to kind of like bridge that gap with just putting the word optional in front of it. Where did, where did, the, what was the genesis of that? I just, I just, uh, that's just kind of my approach, I guess. I, I don't think there was like one like defining moment. I just okay. look at things and, and I start with that question, why are we doing this? I, I that's what I, we flipped our back to school night. Here's another example. And I said, why, why are people coming to back to school night? They're coming to see the teacher, make sure they're a nice person, see where their kids are going to be. But what, what the back to school night experience was for parents was they'd come in, they'd get a 20 minute jaunt through or 10 minute jaunt through a bunch of curriculum that if you gave them a, you gave them a quiz, they'd fail for sure because there's no way to listen to all that in the, in the speed. And so we said, let's put it online and let's make back to school night, a meet and greet where we just talk and connect with parents and build relationships. So it, I, I just, I don't know. I, I, it starts with just asking those, why are we doing this this way? And what's what is the real purpose behind this? And so, like for that back to school night question, go ahead. Yeah, I would know. I was just curious if there was something in your in your reading of outside of the subject of education, like you said, because that's one of the things I know that a lot of us are trying to do. We're trying to read Stephen Levitt's and Stephen Dubner's and Malcolm Gladwell's, and yeah. <laughs> kind of like bring in all of those things that that are kind of intuitive, but education just I was is far behind him and then bring them into our practices. So I didn't know if it was something that, that you read that all of a sudden the light bulb went off and said optional. It sounds like it was an evolution of your thinking over time. Yeah, and it was it's I'm a little bit of a like a old school punk rocker from the eighties. 
<laughs> and so I like to question things. I've always kind of brought, brought up that way. And uh, my dad's an, been in education and my brother's a, a teacher. We do like a podcast show called the Bedley Brothers. And um, we just bring on different people. So um, just hearing just different people and thinking of things differently and talking to people that are outside of the education world and and only always hearing like here it's this way or this way and I always go why does it have to be this way or this way why can't it be someplace else and then and it's like and I, and I, I watch and I, I think I put a link in there to the race to nowhere well they're kind of advocating eliminating homework and, yeah. and that's fine but I'm like well but that doesn't meet the needs for everybody and so maybe it's part of me that wants to try to please everybody I don't know um, well, I think also, like, we'd be probably remiss if we didn't speak, and if you guys did already, I apologize, of the work that Alfie Khan has, has been doing, you know, for probably over a decade, trying to persuade people uh, the drawbacks of wasting people's time and not increasing academic performance via homework. Yeah. So, inspiration to you? Oh, he, he totally is. In fact, he's coming on our show. Um, we just booked him to come and, t and talk to us on our show. But, um, yeah, I, he, he, it's hard for him not to be. I mean, uh, the way he, he looks at things differently. That he put, publishes. And I don't, I don't agree with like 100% of everything that Alfie says. I, I just respect that he's questioning things and trying to look at them differently and then build them based on like – actual data and information that's current and, and modern, not build it on tradition, you know? Right. So. Scott, can I ask another question? Go ahead, Dan. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, two, two thoughts on this. Uh, one is, was there any point this year where you were moving along where you said, whoa, I have to, I have to pull back and, and shift off in this direction. This is not going the route it, uh, I, I expected it to. That's number one. And then number two is, now that you've done this for September, do you have any plans that differ from your initial course uh, with this after going through it for a year? I think when I originally start started to like put it into subjects and I just said, am I really doing this? <laughs> so um, there was a little bit of, there's fear. There's definitely fear. And I, and I, and I kept going back to what is best for my students and what is best for my, the families and what is, what's, what is it based on? And this, this is about learning. And so I, I kept having to like bring my mind, my own thoughts back to what's the whole reason I'm, I'm trying this. It's not just to experiment or it, this was, there was, it was founded in that study back in 2007. It's found in, in like as much current information as I could find. And, and it just kept taking me back to that. So yeah, it was kind of scary the whole way through. Um, and, and after, you know, I started to see that it wasn't hitting on some of those fears that I had, then I started to go, okay, this is, this is good. This is good. And so the, the further I got into it, the further past the kind of the initial, oh, it's optional. And the kids get in there like, ah, um, the further they got into understanding, the further I grew as a teacher in trying to engage my kids more. And I'm always trying to engage my kids. I don't want to make it sound like I'm not, but it, it pushed me even further to do that. Um, did, so, you, did you shift any elements, though, as you as you were doing it? Did you shift elements? I the biggest I mean the biggest shift was I just continued to expand it because I started off in one subject area. Uh, and I continue to expand it into different subject areas. So that was that was the biggest shift. All right, um, maybe we could all just give uh, give Scott one of our takeaways from the conversation, and then maybe Scott wants to uh, you know then uh, follow up with him or I don't know whatever he wants to do. And by the way, if you, any of you want me to talk to your staffs, like you know, uh, just yep. let me know. I'd be happy yeah. to. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think yeah, you just open up a new, uh, you know, yet another road that people can go down with options and with thinking outside the box. You know, we're so stuck in how can we keep doing things, um, you know, either this way or that way. And you just really provide that other, you know, that other insight that, you know, we really have to start moving toward, um, you know, bigger adaptations, whatever that looks like in different places. That's great, Daniel. Dan? 
Yeah, and you're you're muted. There you go. I'm sorry. I had to check out for a minute. We're having a thunderstorm here, and one of my puppies freaking out. So I had to attend to him. What was the final question or the final? I was just still hoping everybody could just give a takeaway, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Maybe Scott can just go ahead and give us a, a wrap up. Sure. I well, I think it was great listening to Scott and listening to the questions. And I would say my takeaway is I, I'm going to um, try to advocate that teachers in my building experiment with different ideas. Um, I don't think there's a one size fits all. I, I love the idea of, of the term optional. It's something that never dawned upon me to even consider, but I, I think it can um, I think it can uh, assuage people to to give it a, to give it a try because it's not all or nothing. So experimenting is going to be the key for me going forward when I'm talking to people about the merits of um, not giving homework. Kathleen, thanks, Dan. For me, for me, the thing that's really important is the idea that we're going to have a conversation around learning rather than uh, the elimination of homework. And so um, that gives a, a little bit more a positive um, actually, rather than even the inclusion of the word homework, I mean, in, in general, it's a, I've kind of come up with a, something called a, 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 a Kathleen, you're, I, I don't know if it's everywhere. Where did I write it? Um, you cut out a little bit there, Kathleen. Did she cut out for everybody? She yeah. did. Okay. Uh, yeah, my network connection sucks right now. <laughs> I'm in a hotel. It's our Long Island thunderstorm. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but just just the idea that the conversation needs to be centered around learning rather than uh, tasks, rather than homework rather than not homework. Yeah, great, yeah. great Kathleen. Dennis? I think uh, my biggest takeaways are that, um, you know, time is, our time is precious, right? We only have 24 hours in a day. And uh, we, we have, uh, you know, sometimes we're, we're locked into certain times doing certain things, but I can't imagine how liberating that must have been for your, your students and for their families to be told that, hey, this is this is your time again, and you can, you can choose to use it how you'd like. Um, I think something else that I, I really appreciate is the the value of uh, choice in there. You know, in schools, I think we always have to fight for that to maintain choices for students, choices for families, and I think that's a great way to uh, introduce choice into reintroduce choice into a you know a, a kind of a rigid system at times. Um, and I think really the most important thing maybe is is what learning is all about. Um, it's, been, it's already been said, but it's, you know, learning is not a school thing. You know, learning is a life thing. And when you kind of free people up, you free up their time and say, okay, now that you're not at school anymore, how are you going to extend your own learning? It's really up to you. It's not right. up to you to complete this packet or to complete this worksheet or to complete this, uh, you know, study assignment. Um, and I think those are, that's those are some really wonderful things to uh, bring to, uh, you know, Scott in your case, bring to a ten year old and show them, hey, this is this is your life. You get to do what you want with it. Right. At least until they have a mortgage and a train ride to work every day. <laughs> Danielle? I'm done. You got me. Um, I, I, my takeaway, too, is I, I actually thought at the beginning of this, I was going to talk about practical matters of let's just do it. I'm so excited. I, I want to email my staff now and say, guess what we're doing in September? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, as I listen to you, Scott, I realize well, it's really, this is about what a special teacher you are and, um, how you're coming from a place of learning. And I, I think there's a real mindset change that takes place that wants to be reinforced. I want to say first, but I don't know about first. I think that this the discussion of homework optional is a nice engine to drive that discussion. It's really neat leverage to push that discussion. So I think they almost might happen at the same time. So I'm really excited about it. I, I will absolutely take you up on your offer to speak with my staff or, or parts of my staff. So I think that'd be great. Mm. How about you, Scott? I, I appreciate knowing that uh, there's administrators in all kinds of 
you know, teachers and people and, and different positions that are willing to uh, ask those questions. And I, I think it's, I, I think we live in a, a, a powerful time for change in education and we get to define it. And yeah. if we don't, uh, it's going to be defined for us by legislation or whatever else might step in. So um, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I, when I do things, I try to do it thinking like, you know, and I, I put this in my blog post, but I, I try to do things thinking, you know, is this something that is, is me or that anyone could do? And I think this is something that anyone can do. And we just have to model that risk taking and that courage that comes along with it to uh, question what's best. And, um, and I think that's where most of us are coming from in education is what's best for our kids and students. So yeah. I, I appreciate you listening um, to me talk so much. That's for sure. No, 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 Scott, thanks. It was a it's privilege great. to have this opportunity to speak with you. Thanks for clarifying so much. Thanks for helping us all learn from you through Twitter and your blog. And, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy following you in both of those venues. And thanks, everybody, for uh, jumping in to participate in the, in the conversation. I do have you know, a You'll tweet out the link, the link, the link rather, where we all can pick up the video and share with our staff. Sure, and and I do have a. I'm working on a follow up post on like, how how would somebody else do this if they wanted to? Because I I've got a lot of uh, responsive like, you know, how did you do this? What are the practical pieces about it? So I'm trying to put something together as quick as possible and not have as many errors as my first one had. <laughs> You sound like you've already got a good head for it, Scott. You sound like you, you've got a good sense of what the process looks like. So I'm sure you can. Real, real quick, also, Scott, is there a hashtag that you're using? No, let's make one right now. Hashtag like right? optional homework. Yeah, I was one. I was toying with optional homework or optional just HW. Oh, let's do so optional H W and keep the keep uh, that many uh, characters. Right. Okay. Awesome. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, really, really Before great to be safe and uh, have a great uh, rest of the summer. Yeah, right? great to meet all you guys and stay out of that lightning, please. Yeah, <laughs> I'll see some of you soon. Thank you. Later. All right. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye.